This special monthly UBU episode on hashtag Black Mental Health is sponsored by Janta Neuroscience and supported by The Painted Brain, a California peer-run organization. Well, hello to Jonathan and hi, Rochelle. I am so happy that you all are here together as we have this really important conversation on Unapologetically Black Unicorns pod that is all about Black mental health. So I'm going to just start this off because, you know, I don't do bios. I just kind of, we just jump into the conversation. So Jonathan, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you think it's important for us to talk particularly about Black mental health for Black folks like the three of us? Well, thank you, Karis, and hello, Rochelle. It's really great to be on Unapologetically Black Unicorns again. And the main question that we're thinking about is why it's important to talk about Black mental health. Uh, With respect to myself, I think it's really important because I am a person um, in long-term recovery, both from substance use and also addressing mental health issues. Over the years, I've kind of looked at and explored a number of different tools Uh, everything from traditional therapy to a lot of self-empowerment ideas, everything from writing my poetry to creating tools that I feel others could utilize, and really thinking about the absence of the cultural piece that I missed out a lot in my own life. I really felt that making that connection or reconnecting to culture was really part of my healing. It's an ongoing process. So I think as a person of color in long-term recovery, uh, through recovery, I've been able to really meet a lot of goals, reach a lot of goals. I'd really like for others to feel like they have that opportunity as well. Oh, love that. Love that. Two snaps up. Thank you. What about you, Rochelle? Yeah, thank you once again for having me on here. Um, it's important as a Black woman, as a Black leader, that I support others Um, and learning more about what is mental wellness and how do you plan when a crisis happens. Um, For me, someone that's been hospitalized a number of times and only saw mental wellness is like literally going to the hospital and taking pills. Those were the tools that most people I know use. So for me, I have like a whole nother sense of purpose and working with my community to find ways to engage them on different tools to stay well and to even just destigmatize talking about, you know, mental wellness and mental health issues. So it's important to change the conversation to, you know, look at recovery as it's being possible and that everybody can find tools to support their wellness. Wow. Thank you for also talking about the language. So I think sometimes too, from a cultural perspective, language matters. And sometimes it's easier to enter in when we're using terms that resonate more easily, you know, with the Black community. So I've heard uh, sometimes, you know, mental health or mental illness doesn't really resonate, but things like um, wellness or well-being or emotional health are terms that resonate and are easier to enter into these conversations. Have you all heard that as well in in any of the work that you're doing? Yeah, for me, I think uh, I've been a part of the Black Mental Health Task Force, which is the organization of Black-led behavioral health providers. And we've been taking it back uh, to our cultural practices and healing and healing circles where we use the word healing, where we use wellness, you know, those are terms that our ancestors or the people before us did use. So for me, it's like helping re-educate and help people to learn, like, where have we been? Um, and using terms that our, you know, our grandmothers and, you know, the, te- the people before us have used. So I've been trying to change the language and using tools so that it can, you know, because like you said, cares talking about mental illness and just saying mental illness is it's not going to attract our folks, especially because it's led by the dominant culture. And uh, what we know is like, they're going to just give us some medicine and tell us what to do and lock us up. So mm-hmm. wellness is important using those terms and changing the language. Wow. Wow. That is, uh, you know, such an important message for people to hear, I think, because sometimes we have to do the, what do you call it? Code switching, where we mm-hmm. have to translate what we're hearing 
you know, kind of in the mainstream world into our own cultural language, our own cultural paradigm. So when you've done this um, in mental health, either for your own mental well-being or supporting others, how do you help people think about that kind of dialogue that they might have with a family or a doctor or another support person? What kind of things do you have people think about or what things have you thought about for yourself? First thing that comes to mind for me is agency. And agency, I know there's dictionary definitions of the word, but I think of really seizing the opportunity to speak my narrative, regardless of the discomfort that comes up. And it doesn't mean that I've done it often and I've done it well, but the fact that I've done it at all. And what I mean by that is really articulating where I am, what I need, what my plan is, and enlisting others to support that plan. Because what happens when we don't speak up is we're relegated to certain situations, circumstances. People make decisions for us. People sort of magnify what might be going on with us emotionally and then assume that we're not able to think for ourselves. And so I think it's really important to speak up despite uncertainty, despite pain, despite discomfort, because if we don't, others will. Um, And I think there's a lot of different ways of doing that. I think role modeling is really important. I know that that's something that people do in therapy often. We do it in workshops. We do it in trainings. But it's really important to role model and advocate for yourself so that you are able to articulate what your needs are and how others might help you. And also to have options because not everyone is really able to support. And I think for myself, one of the biggest challenges with um, addressing mental health, mental wellness, and healing is also accepting the frailties of others. Mm -hmm. Um, that everyone is not always up to the challenge. And then if we just process it as rejection, then we'll shut down and really feel like, well, not only do I feel not so good, but the world doesn't think so highly of me. And I still have to chisel away at that myth and do a lot of work around this friend isn't available, but maybe this one will be. So it becomes a rather complex equation in terms of identifying what's going on and also reaching out to resources and also having options and feeling sort of putting yourself on par with other human beings and saying, you know, maybe I'm not always up to the task of supporting someone else. So I want to work on depersonalizing it when someone else is not really able to support me in the way that I'd like to be supported. And that comes from years and years and years of work and continued work. Well, you was preaching over there, but um, just to, I had a couple of thoughts as it relates to like planning around when you're in the hospital or in an emergency because of, I believe, the sometimes the lack of belief and of, of Black women and people of color. It is important to plan. For me, um, being from Oakland, California, this just wasn't even the language that, you know, no one was talking about this where I'm from. Like, oh, planning, making sure you have Uh, If something goes wrong, I mean, I think when you, I guess when it it advanced directives, but for me now as a black leader, I'm really trying to work on uh, empowering folks to learn more about RAP plans, the wellness uh, recovery and action plan. And then also um, we're doing a lot of work to support California in a five-year innovations project to change a state statute around psychiatric advanced directives, uh, which is a planning tool in crisis is so that folks can have a voice and agency over their own treatment. So I'm trying to change the language, change laws. You know, I've, I put myself as the, the nine-year-old girl taking the bus in Oakland and having anxiety, like, or, you know, the 21-year-old um, in Southern California and after I've gotten hospitalized. Like, those, the, no one was telling me to go plan. You know, I just had my little sister who um, eventually came to her, her challenges, um, but that was one of my only supporters, right? So mm-hmm. every time I had a hospitalization, I had no tools. But now that's my goal now is to make sure that, you know, folks can have those tools. Uh, so for me, it's more of like now a journey and a quest to make sure people get access. Wow. Okay, Queen Rachelle, mother of all, (laughs) that is just, yeah, I think this is just such a powerful conversation because I think we understand planning for a cold or planning for the flu Mm -hmm. or planning for those things. But when it comes to our emotional health, 
well, how do you plan to keep yourself healthy? And then how do you do it in a way that works for you to create like a wellness recovery action plan? And what is a RAP plan? I, maybe I'll turn to Jonathan and ask a little bit about what is a RAP plan? If somebody doesn't have access to that, what elements of it can they take and apply? Well, that's a really great question. And I keep reflecting on how uh, we ended on the last podcast when I was talking about discovering the wellness recovery action plan, red book with Mary Ellen Copeland's picture and black and white picture in that damp basement of a psychosocial um, clubhouse where I was on a speaker panel speaking with other people who were experiencing mental health issues about recovery and options and going back to school and, you know, preparing to go back to work. And I found this dusty book in a dusty basement and it became the turning point of my recovery. And I think why it did is because when I opened it up, I saw that I had the opportunity to exercise that agency, to write my own plans, to use my own words, to describe what I wanted to see happen. Even if others considered it far-fetched, I had the power of the pen. I was writing my reality. And I think for myself, what stemmed from that is any number of things can become my wellness recovery action plan. Not the best poet, but writing poetry has really been a coping mechanism for me. So much so that I look back on poetry that I've written 20 years ago and I say, wow, this isn't really half bad because I'm not doing it to survive. I'm now reflecting on it to thrive. And there are some days when writing that poem just to sort of get it out of me, even if no one else ever sees it, is my bridge between desperation and hope. I am so here for everything that you just said. And it reminds me of how I got introduced to Painted Brain and eventually to Rochelle. So Painted Brain is a peer run organization in Los Angeles County. And I got introduced to them. First, the title. When I when I saw the title, I was like, okay, this is about arts. What's what's going on? I love, I love anything artistic. And indeed, that's a lot of the work that they were. There was a magazine, there were ga uh, galleries, and um, they had artists and, and gallery openings and everything sort of really baked in around the arts. So um, really seeing how that is an expressive form in which people can talk about all of the things that are going on in their life or all their hopes and dreams. Rachel, also, I think you've talked to me before about vision boards and using vision boards. Yeah, uh, that's so funny you said that because uh, shout out to my team members, Kevin and Tristan, who are some of the original founders uh, of our of our club or now Painted Brain, but they actually vision boarded the whole Painted Brain. They gave me my job. They visioned um, a leader because the Painted Brain was a project before, but they had envisioned that it was something bigger than it would ever be. Like most of our folks were on disability. They they literally um, showed me the vision board and it had like, Rachelle's gonna be the one of the leaders, the chief operating officer. We're gonna get everybody off disability. Um, we're gonna have over a hundred thousand followers. We're gonna, we're gonna we're gonna be contracting with the state, the federal government. You know what I'm saying? And we're gonna change the face of what mental wellness looks like and, and show that recovery is possible. So vision board and, and just putting something down, even if it's on a piece of paper is real. And we actually have a, a YouTube channel about an episode about vision boarding, but it's real. And I can just attest that everything that we put down um, um, when we originally started uh, incorporating, it actually is happening now. So. I think that that's really important to just plan. It gives you a, a roadmap um, and it gives you hope. Speak things that aren't as though they were and it'll happen. Getting kind of mm -hmm. biblical in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. Uh, so this is, again, one of the things that I, I always think about as you all are talking about vision boards and wrap plans and planning is probably do a lot of it in our head, but we don't put it down in writing. And or we don't put it down in artwork or in a vision board so that um, we can see where it is we want to go and make our way there. When, when we're talking about all of these different things that are helpful for us or who we're going to call or when we're, you know, when we need something, if you're in a situation where somebody needs to know that, wow, call Jonathan's friend, Susie, I'm just making this up because Susie would be able to support Jonathan during this time. Who have you communicated to anybody who those two, three, four friends are or family members are who can be called when you need help, maybe when you're not able to 
articulate that yourself. And I'll ask the same thing for Rochelle as well. I've accepted the fact somewhat sadly that it would really take a lot. Like I'd have to be missing for like two weeks. Well, I'm married. So fortunately there's embedded support there. Like if, you know, my partner can't get in touch with me for, you know, a half a day, he's going to come looking for me. But outside of that, I have this belief that um, people sort of see me as superhuman. And it's like, if he's missing, he's in Europe. If he's missing, he's presenting at a conference. And I used to fight with that notion, like people don't care. And I have to sort of like, if not taking responsibility, taking inventory about what is it that I transmit to the world? I mean, I don't want to test and act more needy than I really am in order to just see if there's support there. But it's sort of gotten to the point where I do have to lean more on what I call my higher power, my God. I have to be more truthful and direct with people in my life because I just don't see the support. And it maybe is, and I'm blind to it, but I don't see it as forthcoming because I think I've done a really good job, maybe not the best sense of fashion, but I can put on a mask um, so well that I don't know what I'm putting it on. And I think people just believe (laughs) he's missing. You know, I tell people I'm feeling sick and depressed and they start telling me their problems. Um, I have a really good friend who does that. and And I said to him, I said, you know, I really needed you to hear me. And he said, you have a PhD and all this. And I said, oh, wow. (laughs) So I realized that it's an opportunity for me to have to do a compassionate teaching moment, not be angry, not attack the person, not unfriend them, but to say, wow, you know, I used to think that way too. And um, it's really easy to get caught up in titles and forget about humanity. And even if their perspective doesn't change the fact that I did a little bit of self-advocacy around my social supports, it makes me feel like, well, I did a really good job. I didn't lose a friend because they weren't where I didn't think they should, where I thought they should be. And so I'm making a little bit of a joke out of it because it used to be a really maudlin theme for me. Like nobody cares. I could be laying up here dead. And um, it's not true, but I just think that um, that's my perception. And I have to work on healing that perception, even in the absence of evidence that people would come running. I'm not one of those people where, you know, nobody, they're not going to come look for me in the crack house. You know, it's like <laughs> you had to have gotten yourself out of there. So mm-hmm. I still struggle with that, and I'm 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 glad you asked the question. Um, but that is quite a quite a complex labyrinth of ideas around like who would who call. I mean, my partner knows who he would call, and that's important. But like, right, right. I don't think I have one of those friendship networks where people are going to collaborate and come save me. I think for me, I'm I'm um, even though I'm a public person, I'm a very very private person. I mean, on this podcast, certainly I've shared a lot about. My, my personal mental health, physical health life, if you will. However, <laughs> uh, when it comes to telling people that I'm not at my best right now, I really could use a little extra support. Instead, I sort of just hide away, which I think is very common for many people is they won't tell people that they're struggling. And, you know, there's another burden, I think, you know, again, uh, the model peer leader, you know, and and peer as in, yeah, that part, right? Uh, People who are uh, with lived experience who are doing this work and leading in this work, maybe they're running organizations, they're kind of in high level positions. And and of course, it can be in any position, right? But this idea that people are already baked in thinking that you are going to get ill. That that is what happens in this in this field is that, well, you know, it's kind of hard to hire a peer because well they're going to get sick and it's like well anybody's going to get sick what the hell are you talking about right you know let's just be like what you talk about Willis like let's just be real that that <laughs> is kind of what happens to just people but because you're a peer and you have this title generally, um, it's it's known then that you have a mental health and or substance use condition and particularly for mental health it becomes questionable about your ability to maintain recovery and be quote unquote stable. But I, I've gotten a little bit better. You know, my, my father knows what I need when I need it since we've had this conversation um, many times. But uh, other than that, I'm, you know, I don't know who knows. And that that's making me think about who should I kind of pull into my inner circle and say, you know, Hey, I'm going to have your number in my um, cell phone as a, you know, second emergency contact or third emergency contact, 
Or when I need this, can I call on you? Is this the kind of thing that you could help me with and have that somewhere listed so people know other than myself? Um, relative to the support network, um, well, I, like I said, I always had my sister. Um, and then literally after she died, um, we started Painted Brain as the company. So that gave me a whole network of people to call on. Literally, people are going to check on me like it or not, every day, any day. So, I mean, 10 years ago, I would say, oh, no. I mean, the times I've been hospitalized, yet be traditional family members are in a silo. But now that I've created community, um, I really have a lot of people to check on. But, I, I mean, I still have days where, like you said, that model um, peer leader, where the burden is on me. I mean, the other day, my chest was hurting. I had to call my mom and I was like, mom, I think I'm having a heart attack. She was like, girl, that's anxiety. I had that. She's <laughs> like, that's anxiety. You just got like, I had that when I was younger. And she's like, just breathe. You know, but people know I'm doing the work like John did. Like, I'll be, I'll say that's just my language now because I don't like being a burden to people. I'll tell people exactly what I've done, what I'm doing. And then I'm like, I'm still struggling. Um, so for me, I literally can call, particularly like my other business partner, Eli, and um, and just tell him like, hey, I'm struggling. Um, I need help, or I'm gonna be going to the hospital, or my son. You know, these are people outside of my traditional family um, networks. But that was a long time coming, mm -hmm. and you know, so I'm completely blessed to have people outside of my direct network. But I'm really still also afraid to even tell other people because like so many people are looking at me. I mean, I like Karis. You know, I am more public. You know, and I feel like people are kind of they're already expecting us to have a breakdown. So for me, I'm like, I'm going to beat the odds. Like I'm going to find my safe people. And those are my safe people to tell when I'm I'm feeling crazy or I'm not feeling well. And then the other people I'm, I'm going to, you know, present this way. Um, and this is what is what's needed. But one more thing, my hydrotherapist, which is nothing to do with with mental health, but she's a, a LMFT and an RN. And I was talking to her one day and you don't even know, I was on the, the bed and she's like, you know what, Rochelle, you're going to need someone in addition to just love on you, to just talk to you, listen to you. Don't, don't interrupt you. Like just listen, like all around. I'm still looking for that. <laughs> that first I tried with my mother um, who I love, but she's my mother. She's your mother. <laughs> and so, yeah. So it's really hard for her to listen sometimes. You know, but I think we do need to find that, you know, those one or two people that can just love on us um, and be there for us and listen to us. And, and and sometimes don't say what you've done. But when I like the L.A. Times interviewed me uh, like a month ago and they were like, well, what would you say to the 14 year old girl? And so I even asked myself that now with this question, like at 14, you know, on the onset of me getting hospitalized, I did call a friend. I had to think about it and I just tear up and she's my Facebook friend and she's the one that called the police for my mother. So, you know, I, I wish I, I mean, I instinctively knew that someone cared about me, but I wish that there was more in the school system that talked about like wellness, not like you're in a crisis because it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have resonated with me if it was, you know, all like negative and mental illness and bad, bad, bad. But like, how do you be empowered to, you know, like really strength based language. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that's really important too, like for us to think about, yeah, we're talking about as an adult, but we got to think about how we can help these youth, particularly, you know, men and uh, young women of color yeah. that, you know, they, we need to change the language for them so that they can have safe people and have a plan as well. Okay. Um, that's always in the back of my mind. Yes, yes, yes. Well, as I was listening to Rochelle, I really, um, I was able to sort of turn the glass a little bit and see it as more than half full and more than half empty, because it's easy to focus on the challenges and what we don't have. But I was thinking about the last time that I was hospitalized in 2000. And I, to this day, I have this friend. I remember calling him and describing what I was feeling and the sense of unsafety that I felt. And I think what I really felt great about is I said, it wasn't like, please come get me. And then, oh, I can't, because then you have the rejection on top of feeling helpless. But I remember getting a shower and putting clothes in a bag and getting a cab and going to the psych ER. And he and his partner met me there. 
And I remember when I was lying on the gurney, him talking to me and saying, I deeply care and I'm sorry that you're in, in the pain that you are. And what makes this friend really special is that he's always telling me about the things that I do well. Mm-hmm. And I recently had to affirm him and say, you know, you've seen me at my worst and at my best. And you've always, you've never made me feel a lack of dignity. And so I need to, I need to speak to that because even though, you know, people are hard to reach. So having the person to love on you, I think we have to focus on their ability to love on us and not the possibility that we can, the probability that we can get in touch with them. Because like, I think it's hard to reach people in this day and age. We're all overly busy. People got a lot going on. You know, we're in a pandemic. But when people can be there, some people do it really well. And um, I do have a couple of friends like that. And I actually do have another peer leader that I could tell anything to. And uh, if I asked her to call my husband to say, I'm in danger, I think that she would. So I think, as I said before, it's sometimes about reshaping our reality to say, well, I do have more than I probably think I have, but it's easy to focus on what's not there or the risk factors. And that gets really scary. Yeah, I I couldn't agree with you more. I think over the past few years, I've uh, really learned how to reach out and trust because I think the other thing is the, the trust factor. You know, if I'm going to bring somebody in and tell them when about when I'm feeling most vulnerable and they protect that, I, I, I guess I've always not trusted people would protect, you know, protect the privacy, protect the conversation, uh, protect, you know, me. <laughs> and, um, you know, actually I've been pleasantly surprised by people like Jonathan, who I have texted on more than one occasion, can I call you? Can I call you? I just need to like get this out. And, you know, you've always been very amenable to, yeah, you call me tonight or yeah, can, can, do you need it right now or a couple hours? And just being able to talk something through is so valuable and I have other friends that I've been able to do that with, Rachelle included. So, um, you know, that can also be so um, invaluable and finding that space where people will talk about and help you hear your strengths because it's so often we can doubt ourselves, especially in the midst of how we understand being black in America. And, and today is an interesting day. We're having this conversation, of course, as we still go through another period of, I would say, some unrest because of sort of what's happening on the you know, national scale, where we know there are inequities just based on our complexion. I always say our complexion becomes somebody else's complication, but that complication um, is something that affects our mental wellness. Well, what are some what are some things that we should be doing literally daily, and especially during tougher times, the pandemic and the um, inequities that we're seeing, the racial sort of reckoning? What should we be doing? Do you think? Um, I guess we're going. I'm going through it now, and I'm watching the TV. And I'm just seeing, I'm just seeing gross injustices um, that my ancestors have went through and went through worse times. And, and for me, um, I have to first realize, like, particularly with microaggressions, that I'm not crazy. Like, that's the first thing. Like, this is real. You're in this time. And you, you, there is hope. Uh, So for me, it's really important that I find community and sense of purpose. So I am doing the work. Like, so when I watch the news, instead of just like complaining, I'm like, okay, I am a social justice leader in our community. I have the ability to use my platform to be an example for women of color, to show them that recovery is possible, that, you know, that you can make it. I'm about to hire a wellness coach um, that just focuses on my, just my wellness, what I eat, what I put in my body, how I move and how that impacts my occupation uh, that, you know, I'm not saying that everyone has access to that, but I didn't even, I wasn't even thinking of that before. And then it was like, that's really important, even how I show up. So um, the individual self is um, me really focusing on my health. And then the the macro is like, what work am I going to do being on this platform, talking to the black community about wellness practices and finding ways to reach, you know, populations. My interest particularly is for black men and bringing access. So that's what I'm doing. Also, like I'm, co- I'm collaborating with other groups of black men to educate other men on wellness practice and to not necessarily normalize, but to, I don't know, maybe, nor- I don't know, we got to change the word, but to bring access um, 
to mental health resources in a, our culture that has a lot of stigma around it or just perceptions of just taking medicine and, and going to the hospital. Um, so yeah, that's some of the things that I have control over as a black community leader with myself and my connection to community. Um, and that's how I'm gonna address it when I see the us being gunned down by ourselves and by the police, right? You know, what am I gonna do about our public health crisis with HIV, diabetes, you know? So I, I know it's a lot and I'm a, I'm a social practitioner and I, all these things, I read about this stuff all day and I have to focus it on like, okay, what can what's in Rachelle's control as an individual and even at the family level, how I show up for my family, um, how do I model wellness and recovery? Yo, Shay, they call me Shay. Shay's working out. She's making sure she's gonna go work out. Shay's, you know, making sure she's doing her reading. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm I'm trying to do the work and whatever individuals can do to make change, they, they have to do it in a positive way. But that's my way. All right. All right. Jonathan. I first want to acknowledge Rochelle for like throughout this conversation and throughout listening to your earlier podcast is that you have an array of like concrete things that you do to address the issues that we're talking about. And that's a place that I really want to get to. And once again, it could be a blind spot because I've always wanted to teach and having that opportunity to work with others to think critically about social issues and to sort of shift perspectives and work in a way to help people be empowered in a very unjust and equitable system. So I'm teaching a course in foundations of social work practice, and most of the students are white. And I have to admit that they, they, they seem to be either more woke than I realized or at that threshold of awareness. And they're going to be working with many people who look like you and me and just really hoping that that shift in perspective and that awareness uh, around privilege and inequity bring about and contribute to better outcomes for people utilizing services. And so sometimes it's really hard to see like where we are positioned as a dot in the larger equation and how we're impacting change that's necessary. So, you know, teaching is something that I'm doing that's concrete, but I kind of hear you as like your stuff is like so immediate and, and I just appreciate what you're doing. And, you know, even as an emerging researcher, like the work that I want to do in terms of like working within a community, help them to understand and defi define and understand and, you know, really look at posing solutions for things that they would like to change and being that agent of change, mm -hmm. but in a non-hierarchical system, but coming in with a little bit of expertise and tools and experience and some credentials that, might give me access to resources to initiate that. And so I always look at education as a way of empowering myself. And then just lastly, there was something that I kind of jotted down to myself because this is far from concrete. It's rather ethereal, if that's the word, but it's important like keeping the vision, keeping the hope and enriching the journey and claiming the destination. Because sometimes, and I think it's the escapist mindset that like I have this goal and as soon as I reach that goal, you know, it won't matter that I suffered throughout my journey, but it's like, no, brother, you don't have to suffer. You may not love your circumstances, but you can enrich them, you know, or I, I should make an I statement. I can enrich my circumstances. I can enrich my journey, even if I don't love everything about it, because in retrospect, I want to look back and say that maybe that destination that I'm claiming is going to look different than I think it is. And I don't want to feel like I was in purgatory just to kind of get somewhere that may have not even been the best fit for me. So I don't know. Just one concrete example is that I decided that tonight I'm going to try very hard not to consume anything with sugar before I go to bed because my sleep hygiene has been awful. And in preparing for this podcast, I just said, that's a small measure. That's like a smart goal. It's well, it ain't all that simple, but it's measurable. I need to feel better during the day. So it's like, yeah, I'll make scientific inquiry out of self-improvement. So um, that's kind of, because I want to be in good shape to help, uh, to continue to support causes. And in order to do that, I need to kind of look at my own health and wellness first. 
Right, right, right. So I love that SMART goal that, what is that specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and- And timely. Time, timely. Specific Look at timely. that. <laughs> all right, all right. So you all have really brought into this conversation some, you know, your personal truths. So I call that the spilling the tea part, um, as well as really speaking to providing along with that truth, actionable steps people can think about to take in their own lives. I, I heard a lot around I'm um, having, you know, planning forward and however you do that, whether it's a vision board or if it's a, a gratitude list, a rat plan, you know, using things like prayer and meditation, I'm um, having networks of, of friends, colleagues, and others, uh, family members who uh, can do bits and parts of what you may need, because not everybody can be at all, right? Like I would love my dad to be able to help me with everything, but some things, yeah, I love you, dad, but no, <laughs> you know, I need somebody, I need somebody else. Um, and then um, how to reframe, sort of reframe some of the experiences that we may have to look at them as growth opportunities. And then lastly, um, as we were just talking, especially when the world just seems so big and everything around us that we don't have control over, you know, thank you, you know, for talking about, but what can I do? What do I have control over? What can I do that is safe and impactful so that I can make the change wherever I'm able to make that change, be the change you want to see, I think. So I just want to, I hope I wrap that up pretty. I hope I summarized everything that I, that I heard because it was, it was really, really just a joy to talk with you both, especially as it pertains to our Black mental health in the Black community. You all are true, unapologetically Black unicorn. So I thank you for that. And I thank you for joining today. Thank you, Jonathan. It was amazing. Thank you, Cares. Thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And looking forward to people listening in and joining next month, fourth Tuesday of the month. Thank you. Thank you.